Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. David Wild, Vice President of Performance Improvement, in for Chief Medical Officer Dr. Steve Stites this morning. We're coming to you from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio, and today we welcome KDHE Secretary Dr. Lee Norman back to the program with an update on the vaccine rollout and a look at the current infection rates across Kansas. But first, Dr. Dana mm -hmm. Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, is here as usual. Dana, how'd we do overnight with our numbers? You know, we're still pretty good. Um, nine acute active infections with five in the ICU, two on the ventilator. We still have seven uh, in that recovery period, so under 20 total patients, which, again, I think, um, you know, if we can keep decreasing that number, we know that the rolling seven-day average for Kansas City area is still around 100 or so. So uh, not doing too bad. Hayes has three active infections and one that recovery period as well, um, which I think is still fairly good for their capacity. But Well, speaking of numbers, you mm -hmm. and uh, we have been watching the videos and pictures of spring break gatherings across the U.S. and Florida and other areas. Uh, where um, the questions have been concerning about transmission, and in some cases, some cases like Miami Beach, where the mayor declared a state of emergency, uh, and police officers had to be engaged mm -hmm. to help control the crowd, mm -hmm. uh, over fears that these gatherings would become super spreader parties. We know virus variants are out there and are concerning, and we don't yet completely know how effective current vaccines will be against those variants. With that in mind, we thought we'd take a moment to take a peek at how last year looks compared to this year as far as disease transmission in the community. So this is a simple look at what's happening in Kansas. Uh, the box down at the very bottom on the left-hand side says on March 24th, 2020, one year ago, how many new cases per day were we seeing in the state? And that number was 45. Uh, and that was proceeding, immediately proceeding, actually, a small mm -hmm. spike of up to maybe 200 or 250 a day or so. Uh, but that's a good reminder that today we are well above that 200 or 250 average per day. So before any bump from spring break, it's a reminder to all of us, um, we are already significantly higher in the number of new cases per day here in Kansas than we were a year ago. That's very likely the case uh, in most, if not all, of those areas that we saw pictures from over the last week or so, and likely to be the case as uh, spring break, although it's been spread out over several weeks in many school districts or by many universities, but as spring break uh, continues over the next week or two. Um, that undoubtedly will have an impact on disease transmission both in those areas locally and mm -hmm. also as people return home. If you think about yeah. other events that we know of where large numbers gathered when community transmission was still a question or a concern, you know, we saw lots of uh, information out of the Dakotas, for example, mm -hmm. around Sturgis, yeah. where um, the number of people who were there and yep. uh, traveled and, and maybe transmitted the disease or uh, did become ill, spread back out to their communities and we didn't see a huge bump in other areas, but you definitely saw a big increase yeah. in yeah. those who lived in and around uh, the area of the gathering. So we'll be watching both, uh, undoubtedly. And the next slide is a reminder of what that translated to here in our hospital. So this is our census in the hospital. And look at where we were, right? The gray line is the total number of people in the hospital. The blue line is the ICU and the mm -hmm. red is the non-ICU, so people on regular hospital beds. You can see coming into the week of spring break last year, right, we were averaging in the single digits, similar to where we are now. Yeah. Um, and uh, immediately following that, we saw an increase uh, of several fold, actually. We went from averaging around five to averaging around 35 mm -hmm. pretty quickly in a matter of a week or two. And while we don't anticipate maybe a, a seven-fold increase in hospital patients over the next week or two, um, we're definitely concerned that any event that leads to increased transmission, whether it be because of travel and gathering for spring break or um, anything that happens here uh, or really anywhere related to the, a change in the way we are gathering and interacting, especially for those that are unvaccinated uh, in our communities. So. Yeah. 
that's a primer. I think we'll we'll talk about that much more as the day uh, goes on here. Yeah. yeah, I think the key word there for that you said was unvaccinated. So hopefully the vaccine, especially for those 65 and older, 60 and older, um, now as that is rolling out to more of the general population, is really going to help reduce those hospitalizations and those uh, you know uh, unnecessary mortality. You know, lots of news uh, as well around vaccines and other things over the last 24 hours. But before we jump into that discussion with Secretary Norman, are there any reporter questions on the line this morning? Sure. Good morning. Cody Holyoak with Channel 9. Good morning, Cody. Cody. Hey, good morning. Uh, you, you mentioned it first, uh, Dr. Wild. So let's talk about AstraZeneca. I know you're kind of hinting at it a little bit there. Uh, there was a report, uh, I think the NIH came out, or one of the, uh, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board came out, said that they were concerned by info released by AstraZeneca on their initial data from their vaccine trial, uh, they expressed concern that they may have included outdated information. Uh, for the layperson, what does that mean, A? Uh, B, does that affect negatively vaccine hesitancy, which I know is a struggle that you guys have to face every day? Yeah, so maybe I'll start with what actually is the Data Safety Monitoring Board, because you're right, that is the group that came out and said we uh, maybe have a concern about some of the data that was released publicly by AstraZeneca uh, yesterday. So in the United States, um, the Data Safety Monitoring Board has actually been established. It's an independent group of reviewers. Some are vaccine experts, some are epidemiologists, some are statisticians, but it's an independent group of uh, experts who review the data from all three of the trials right now. So from Pfizer from Moderna and uh, from, well, actually from Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, so four, all four. Um, they see the data coming out of those studies, those trials, before even, say, the FDA group considering EUA applications or the CDC group um, deciding how vaccines should be sort of allocated and administered to different populations. So this is the team, the Data Safety Monitoring Board is the team that will have seen all the data, including recent data, about uh, the ongoing AstraZeneca trial in the United States and uh, presumably any information or data coming out of trials worldwide that would be included as it uh, sort of pertained to um, a submission for an EUA. So that's the group that said, hey, we have a little bit of a concern, and the way we understand it, Cody, is exactly as you mentioned, that um, the concern is that the data shared yesterday might not be the complete or most current data set. Mm -hmm. So that's really the answer to, to what happened yesterday. Uh, you know, Dana, I think, you know, Cody asked this question of, well, does that lead to vaccine hesitance? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, as I listen to this, this is exactly as the process is supposed to work. Yeah. The Data Safety Monitoring Board is supposed to step up and say, hang on a second, mm -hmm we need the complete picture. And it sounds like that's working exactly as it was supposed to for a vaccine that's not even yet been submitted for EUA. Right. And so for me, this shouldn't add to anyone's hesitance about the vaccine. This is exactly the process that we, sh we should see happening. No, but it, it, you know, it's, it, it is one more step. And, um, but the DSMB, or da Data Safety Monitoring Board, is doing what it should be doing. From what I understand from the news reports, uh, Usually there is some communication between these organizations, the, the pharmaceutical company and uh, whatever organization that may be, NAID uh, and the Data Safety Monitoring Board for that, to put out that press release. So it is unusual, uh, but again, yes, that's what the Data Safety Monitoring Board is supposed to do. And so I don't think it should add to the hesitancy. I think for AstraZeneca in particular, it's just one more road bump that we have seen since the beginning of those trials. So I think it can go one of two ways. Either they'll look at everything, say everything, yeah, you're okay, you're doing this. Or they'll say, no, that data doesn't match up. So, But overall, if it is emergency use authorized, uh, I would have people not have the hesitancy because it has rigorously gone through that, that monitoring board and looking at all the data. So um, it may, but, but I would hope it wouldn't because that is the process, just like you said. Dr. Norman, anything uh, from your perspective you'd like to add to, to our answer to Cody's question? I think what you've said is spot on, uh, Dr. Wild and, and uh, Hawkinson. The, uh, and we have to remember that this is a normal process and it's not unique to this particular vaccine. These, but the vaccines are su under such scrutiny and worldwide 
um, attention that I think it's gotten run up the flagpole. Uh, but I think it's just a normal process to go through. And uh, you would not want it to lead to people being reluctant to receive that vaccine once approved or any vaccine for that matter. Um, but it's just that everybody is laser beam focused on the vaccines and it's become newsworthy that the other thousands of products that go through this on a regular yearly basis uh, just don't get that kind of scrutiny. Yeah, I think Secretary Norman's point is, is right on. You know, I'm on a DSMB, a monitoring board right now for a special populations clinical trial in a different, with a different vaccine, not even a COVID vaccine. So this is just everything that happens. Any time that you have clinical trial, that board is there to protect the patients, um, and that's what it's doing. And ultimately, the data will be reviewed, and again, the safety will be evaluated. Great. Any other reporter questions on the line? I do have a follow-up with Shane Bergen. He's with uh, KCTV5, and it's still on AstraZeneca. He said, bottom line, would you advise your patients to get AstraZeneca vaccine? And, and if there were other vaccines available, would you say still say, get AstraZeneca? Well, I think at the moment, the answer to that is we've not seen the data, and it's not EUA approved. And so when we have all of that, we could answer that question. Um, it's not available. We don't have the data. It, it really is sort of a theoretical question at this point. I think my answer would be if it gets EUA yeah. and is reviewed and, and uh, given that approval, then the answer would be yes. We should put it in like every other vaccine option we have, and yeah. people should trust that that means that the safety and efficacy hurdles that are necessary for our population have been cleared and, and it's good to go. Yep, that's a good answer. All right. Well, Dr. Norman, I know we already snuck you in here for, for Cody's question, but thanks for joining us mm -hmm. again. Um, what are you thinking when you see pictures and reports of, say, what, uh, what was happening in Florida over the weekend? Well, Unfortunately, it's like deja vu all over again with Memorial Day last year and other holidays that we've seen. Um, and I think your cautionary note is a really important one, David. The, as of today, we have 27 states in the United States that have their, their trend line going the wrong direction. Almost every state was having a nice decrease in the seven-day rolling average of cases, but that has really changed over the last week or two, and there's been a reversal in 27 states, and we cannot turn a blind eye to that. Fortunately, Kansas is not one of those states. We're still, still seeing a decrease, as uh, Dr. Hawkinson pointed out. But COVID-19 is not gone and it's not forgotten. The, uh, on Monday yesterday, we re uh, from Friday to Monday, we recorded 615 more cases. So back to your earlier numbers, David, 200, you know, you're talking about a couple hundred cases a day. We're right at that right now uh, in the state of Kansas. We had eight new deaths re we recorded. Um, so uh, we still have a ways to go. I think the we're really uh, picking up the pace on the vaccine. We uh, we're right at about 1.1 million doses having been recorded as administered to Kansans. We know there's more out there that are not quite yet recorded. You'll recall I talked about a data recording issue. We we've, we've done some workarounds and are cleaning that up. We went we blew by 19 states last week in terms of our rankings of the percentage of vaccine that is being administered. Uh, I found out some interesting things also about vaccine distribution. As a lot of states have not requested their full allocation, which we kind of like it because it gives more to the rest of us. Um, but some states are are uh, decreasing their amount of allocation just uh, in order to match it up with the amount administered. Quite honestly, I'd rather have the vaccine in our state, even if it's in inventory, until we can um, increase the uh, vaccination sites. We are going to do a lot of additional provider alerting this week uh, because we expect 100,000 additional Johnson & Johnson doses to be ordered this week and to come in next week. The medical practices and primary care and specialty offices have not been primary vaccinating sites just because they're rather low throughput by comparison to uh, health departments, uh, pharmacies, and hospitals. Um, but it's important, to, back to this question of vaccine hesitancy, to get vaccine in the hands of the uh, primary care and specialty providers who know patients, they know the people really well, and are going to be the ones to talk with them and to hopefully defuse hesitations and fear. Uh, so I think in summary, uh, we're pretty happy with where we are right now. We've got uh, 60 National Guard troops sprinkled around. 
We, we bring on sometimes 20 to 30 contract nurses a day to assist some of the mass vaccinations uh, settings. And we're trying to roll with it in terms of the amount of the allocation. We've not let a single dose slip through our fingers. We try to bring everything we can into the state of Kansas. Um, and I think the trajectory can be good, but as you point out from whether it's Miami Beach or Detroit or any points between, there are states that are really struggling. And I am concerned that it might be due to these variants because some of the states up to 30 to 40%, and Dr. Hawkinson may want to comment on this, some states 30 to 40% of their positive COVID tests are now uh, the one of the variants most uh, typically the the B117 UK variant, and that does concern me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, the variants are concerning, um, especially for some therapeutics, uh, especially like the monoclonal antibodies, um, the B135, uh, 351 from, from South Africa. Luckily, we do have a little bit of information um, from Benchtop uh, uh, Laboratory Basic Science looking at Moderna Pfizer, where they were looking at, you still do get a good amount of antibody titers. Again, we don't know the correlate of protection. We don't know what that means. Uh, but the antibodies re are reduced just a little bit. Uh, but we also have to remember it's not just about antibodies, it's T cells. We do have some, some of the data from um, uh, the Johnson & Johnson addendum to the FDA as well that showed uh, still pretty good 60 to 70 percent efficacy uh, of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine versus the 351, the South African variant. So it looks like we still do have protection. We just don't know in, in what amount. You know, Lee, you made so many great points in that answer to the first question. I want to start, um, I'll come back to it just because I do think it's really important. You. Um, you talked about 200, that number of 200 new cases per day sort of on average right now. It's the reason that I showed the slide of where we were a year ago, 45 average new cases per day a year ago. We're four to five times greater in the number of new cases per day right now than we were a year ago. And I think it's easy for that to get lost in the fact that that is so much better than where we were, say, in December. Yeah. Um, and that's true. But, um, you know, that, that reinforcement that this isn't over yet, we still see uh, a significant disease burden in the community is important. Secondly, um, I, I was very pleased yesterday as well to see really on all of the sites that show us the data around vaccination, how much movement the state of Kansas made. Uh, really, um, as your team has worked so hard to actually get the appropriate picture of what's been administered, now coming close to even the top quartile. Um, uh, for as far as you know, states and percentage of of, uh, of those that are vaccinated in our population, and I know that uh, your team and really all of the the resources that um, the state has put into this is <laughs> have been working uh, overtime, and that's that's said not lightly um, because it's probably like two times, not overtime. <laughs> um, you know, in that vein. Well, number one, I would be remiss if I didn't say, if you've got any doses, we'll take them. We got people lined up. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we, we definitely know we have the ability to do far more vaccinations per week or administrations than we are now. But, um, but probably more importantly, you talked a bit about how we're now uh, sort of entering phase three and four and how Johnson & Johnson is going to play a part in that. Um, how did yesterday go, the first day, really open to phase three and phase four in Kansas? You know, uh, I think it went really well. Um, it's, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of been, been inventing things as we've gone, but our basic prioritization plan and schedule have really, um, I think, uh, served the, our people well. Uh, there is always the concern, and re why did we combine and why did Governor Kelly make the executive decision to combine phase three and four essentially together is that, and we've talked about this all along, that there's not a bright line between what's a serious medical condition and what's an other medical condition. And, uh, uh, and so that gets kind of messy. Uh, we're trying, uh, and we're even changing the intake form for people when they sign up to get a vaccine so that they'll, they'll mark that they have a condition. We're not getting real specific on um, how severe is it? Because, you know, that's a qualitative judgment and uh, there's, there's no scale that you can put a number on that does that. So, uh, I hope that it just won't get, the vaccination sites won't get overly flooded um, as long as there's a scheduling mechanism in place. We actually have some counties that are not requesting vaccine, even entering phase three and four. And the reason was, is that toward the very end of two, and granted, these are smaller and more rural counties, 
Um, but that'll allow for a considerable amount of redistribution. But we're giving the vaccine to anybody, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, re, the vaccinating sites who request it, we're pushing it out to them, but there are some not requesting it. We are, remember when we, back in the olden days, like in December, when we were had uh, 40,000 ish doses a week coming in, we're looking at 140, 150, 160,000 doses coming in a week uh, over these next few weeks. I think that everything's going to be accelerated, David. I think that three, four, we're going to just go through a whole lot of people uh, and uh, a terrific amount of catch up. We see where uh, vaccinating sites used to take a, an hour to fill up all their slots, and now they're uh, 10, 11, 12 hours to fill up their registration slots. We've even seen a few uh, slots go unfilled. We're recognizing that some people uh, sign up from multiple different sites and go get vaccinated at one site and then no show for the others. That's human behavior. Um, and that's why I tell people to be on the waiting list and be able to scramble if they get a call that uh, we're at the end of our day here. We've got uh, 24 extra doses. Why don't you, you and your spouse come on them over now? So be nimble. Absolutely. You know, I know um, you have a limited amount of time this morning. There are two other specific questions I want to get to with you. Number one. Um, and there's a ton coming in coming over in, here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, you, you may or may not have any insight into this, but Andy Slavitt, uh, so part of the, the current administration's team, came out yesterday when asked and said, basically, I have significant reservations that Johnson & Johnson is going to be able to meet their target for the 100 million doses that, that we have a contract with. Um, you mentioned that there are J&J &J doses coming 100,000 over the next week or two. Um, it's our understanding that those are sort of the doses that were ready and primarily those that were ready and on the shelf that are being really pushed out to the states now. Any other insight um, that you have into whether we're going to continue that sort of J&J &J, um, allocation on a weekly basis after this? We're not basing any of our planning uh, on a continued high amount of J&J. &J. We kind of feel that we'll take whatever we can get. And I'm really thankful that it's a one-dose series because the worst case scenario would be that we would get one dose into people and then not have the ability to put in the second dose. And uh, at least with J&J, &J, that's not a concern. Uh, but we have no assurances, anything um, um, better than what you said, David. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't have a three-week optical time planning timeline and thank god that our our vaccinating sites are able to adjust and flex up and flex down yeah you know the other topic i wanted to hit on before we get to community questions is uh, you've talked about it a couple of times here um, but um, there's a social vulnerability index mm -hmm. variable that goes into um, how the state has been allocating doses and the weekly morbidity and mortality report around vaccines has shown that we aren't always getting vaccine doses to those who are in those more vulnerable locations, zip codes, populations. Um, I know your team is working hard on that. Um, any sort of thoughts about what we as a community can do to help that problem specifically? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I think that a couple of things must be said, number one. Uh, any, with it, if it's a racial or ethnic group, one of the things we have to remember is that very commonly, we'll be at about 25% that are listed as other. And we do know that certain racial and ethnic groups uh, or mixed race groups, quite honestly, will say, will check other because they don't fit into a neat box or they don't want to be identified in a box. Uh, so I think we're doing better. I wish we could disaggregate that other category and know a little bit more. But in answer to your question, I'm, I think even if we were able to do that, I think we would still be lagging in certain neighborhoods or ethnic and racial groups or socioeconomic groups. Uh, and we have to, uh, I think, have foot soldiers, whether it's, uh, and we are working to mobilize this, the Kansas Leadership Center, working, we have um, mobile trailers that we've taken out, hy V has been very helpful, and others to do what I would call smaller sites. You know, if we can get into an, a, a high-risk apartment building, for example, that has 60 people that need to have a vaccine, to, to not require them because of transportation difficulties, or, but actually take it to them. And so I think to your question, David, any, any vaccinating site that says we have the ability to go to this neighborhood, that community, that church population, et cetera, uh, would be terrifically helpful. And a lot of people are coming forward with that. I, we, there's been all this focus on getting the mass amount of vaccination into the most number of people. And that's been great uh, for pushing down spread. But 
the, from here on, and particularly in these risk populations, it takes customization to push it out and to do special outreach for those populations. You know, our team on both the university side and the health system side is asking a lot of those questions as well, um, thinking about what that might look like or how we could help. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Well, I know we've just got a couple minutes before you yeah, have to four. run. <laughs> Jill, you want to get to some community <laughs> questions? Yeah. Daggers. I don't know how hard your heart out is, Dr. Norman, but they're pouring in, so we may have to invite you back. I'm going to start with a question that kind of comes from the Parsons Sun, and I think I saw that you might have been copied on this. But it, it, essentially, if I'm reading the question correctly, what are your thoughts about Western Kansas and some of the smaller communities? They're waiting on Johnson & Johnson, and they're mm -hmm. banking on it because mm -hmm. they trust the technology more. Well, that's uh, only partly true. Uh, it's a great question. Um, we have pushed a lot of Johnson & Johnson product out into Western Kansas. Um, we've done all the meatpacking plants for, you know, there's 60 meat processing plants in the state of Kansas, and we have pushed out vaccine to all of them. And, you know, interestingly, and this is a, and I'll just put it out there, uh, the Johnson & Johnson product is uh, associated in its production with an immortal f fetal cell line and from the, the decades old. And there are a lot of people that are refusing the Johnson & Johnson product because they're of their Catholic faith. And there's been some instructions from some church leaders that that would be uh, not in keeping with their Catholic faith. So when you look at um, a high majority of Catholic populations in uh, certain communities, particularly out in Southwest Kansas, there's been a high amount of refusal of the Johnson & Johnson product on that basis alone. Uh, I. You know, many cell line, uh, sorry, many vaccines are produced in the same cell line. I'm not going to argue with people's religious beliefs. That's for them to decide. Um, but it does put pressure on uh, Pfizer and Moderna then if people are highly selective. So, yes, uh, it's true what's being asked, but we've pushed a lot of product out there, a lot of the Johnson Johnson. Okay. Jennifer wants to know, can you please discuss the importance of continued masking until more people are vaccinated? She heard Johnson County is considering lifting their mask mandate this week. Well, a couple things. Uh, I think it's premature. Uh, and uh, because, you know, when you only we've had 26% of Kansans that have received their first dose and a, a subset of that have received both doses. So we have a lot of non-immune people out there. And, uh, we, as we've talked on the show, and Dana uh, elegantly describes, it's not 100%. People can still become infected uh, and transmit it. So I think it's too soon to really let our guard down. Um, and I, one thing I'd like to say to people is, even if, the, if your municipality, your county um, says it's no longer mask mandated, you can still wear a mask. You know, it's a free country. Um, masks will never let you down. So uh, just because it, you can doesn't mean you should. All right, I have one minute. We have 60 seconds. <laughs> Um, do you, Dr. Norman, expect Kansas to open up vaccinations to everyone over 16 years old in April, like Missouri and other states? Um, it depends on the amount of vaccine and the rapidity with which the 16 plusers who are getting vaccines now, if they've got um, underlying medical conditions. Um, I think quite likely in April uh, and even by May, it wouldn't surprise me if we opened it up to any willing recipient of the vaccine. Uh, but I'll say, yes, hopefully uh, that we'll get through this current phase three, four, and that could happen, I think, even within the next few weeks, uh, looking into the crystal ball. All right. Well, I know you have to run. Any final thoughts before you leave us, Dr. Norman? No, uh, no, I think we're on a bubble, and, or I guess, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and 27 states are going the wrong way, and we don't want to be one of them. So uh, the mask question is a very pivotal one. Don't let your guard down, and let's get vaccinated uh, uh, and keep on trucking. So thanks mm -hmm. again for the invitation. Sorry I have to sign off a little bit early today. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Lee. Thanks, Take Lee. care. Okay, bye, guys. Jill, you want to hit a couple more community questions before yeah, we, we wrap can. up for the and day? And then tomorrow we have a good panel that I, pr I promise everybody on this, I'm going to make the doctors just rock right mm -hmm. through all these questions. Um, right. I guess one that I would have uh, would in be, um, oh, I know what I want to ask you. I've got a lot of people that have a laundry list of hmm. 
I had this reaction, this reaction, this reaction. So let's rock through those reactions. I've had people say, I had my shot and I had stomach pains. I got my shot, I had fogginess. I had red cheeks and didn't feel well. I had leg pain. Um, are these normal? What are normal symptoms and reactions? Yeah, I mean, I think there could be some psychosomatic issues going on there as well. But we know that other things happen that are not related to the vaccine. There is a lot of heterogeneity, I meaning there's a lot of differences and variability, and that's with the first dose or the second dose. None of those things that are described would be a reason that I would not get my second dose. Right. I, I think it is very possible that yeah. some of those mm -hmm. symptoms described, you know, are related to your immune factory ramping up for yeah. a period of time after Absolutely. a dose. They're not severe. Um, I don't think there's any reason to consider them uh, as, a, as a reason not to get, to get a dose. And, you know, it's hard for us to know with certainty. Um, as Dana said, those mm -hmm. things are going to happen for a number of reasons, regardless of vaccine dosing. Uh, but I think even if, even if temporally they are related, no reason with those symptoms or, or potential adverse reactions to not get the vaccine. And I think another uh, point in the variability is that the anecdotal reports, we've heard of people who have long haul symptoms mm -hmm. and they get a vaccine and then they don't have those symptoms anymore. So there is just a lot of variability right now. All of those things are continuing to be uh, evaluated and studied and hopefully we'll have better answers moving forward. But I don't think those are anything that's significant that you should not get your second dose. Definitely get your second dose. And then a final question might be, because I know you've got a heart out today, too. Um, I have a lot of questions from people that are taking steroid medication. They're on medications for immune uh, suppressed compromised, compromised immune systems. I sometimes say my words backwards. Um, and they want to know, should they stop medication? Should they get a shot? What do you advise? So we have a lot of patients yeah. in our yeah. um, sort of care who find themselves in that situation. Yeah. Um, and have for a long time, a long time for a number of other vaccines. You spend yeah. a lot of time with that group, yeah. so yeah, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first question is to talk with your care provider, your care team that's prescribing those medications. In general, I would say do not stop. You are probably still going to be okay to get other vaccines because just like you said, there are other vaccines that people are getting. Most likely those populations are getting yearly influenza vaccine. They're getting their pneumonia vaccines. Hopefully they've gotten their shingles vaccine, all of those things. So first of all, talk with your medical team. Do not stop those medications. And more than likely, you're still going to be okay to get the vaccine, even while on those chronic uh, medications, those chronic immunosuppressants. But the best thing to do is to talk to your medical team. You know, I have a, a friend and coworker here um, who is immunosuppressed for mm -hmm. a medical reason, um, yeah. who has participated in a national trial where um, immune response is measured uh, in multiple mm -hmm. uh, time series antibody draws after doses of the oh, vaccine, yeah. um, and they're comparing the medicines used for immunosuppression, mm -hmm. the vaccine mm -hmm. um, that was administered, and then the reason for immunosuppression. And they're packaging all that up to get a good sense yeah. of what this means. And so on top of Dana's points, right, we have lots of other vaccines that are given to these patients. Your treatment team has a good picture of what this means and what you might do to make sure you get the mm -hmm. best bang for your buck from your vaccine. We're also understanding very quickly as it pertains to these vaccines, what yeah. we might need to do differently uh, for those patient populations. So much more to come on that. This is another one of those we learn more every day. Yep, and we know there was a recent publication, I think it was New England Journal of Medicine, that looked at solid organ transplants, so heart, kidney, liver, mm -hmm. pancreas, those types of things, and their mounting of antibody response. Mm -hmm. And there were some in those population that had reduced antibody mm -hmm. levels, uh, re reduced antibody response. But again, you have to take into account how close are they to the uh, to the solid organ transplant? What exactly is their immunosuppression? Are there other issues going on as well? So absolutely talk with your medical care team, but more than likely you're still going to be able to get that. All right. Well, tomorrow we have uh, our chief medical officers back from Advent Health, Liberty Health, and Truman Medical Centers. Uh, my friends, Dr. Larry mm -hmm. Botts, Dr. Raghu Adiga, and Dr. Mark Steele, will share their thoughts on upcoming holidays, uh, religious gatherings, spring breaks, and sports, as all of those questions are uh, frequent 
uh, for us all now. And they'll share how vaccinations are going in their hospitals and their patient populations. So exciting day tomorrow. Dana, mm-hmm. as we wrap up today, any any final thoughts? No, I know we'll all be waiting uh, with beta breath to figure out some more about the AstraZeneca uh, data and that, and that issue right there. You know, we were all pretty um, happy that there was one more vaccine that we could use to roll out to as many people as possible to help reduce hospitalizations, severe illness, and death. Um, but we'll wait to see what happens. Hopefully, um, everything will look okay, and that will be shown to be efficacious. And it'll be one more vaccine that we can use. But until then, we'll just continue Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Moderna. If you have a chance to get any one of those, go ahead and take that chance. Get that shot in your arm. Yeah. And I, I would only say, right, we covered really the gamut today. Mm-hmm. Um, great questions, great conversation, right? We talked about everything from continuing spread to variants to, as Dana just said, get your vaccine. If you get an, uh, you know, the yeah. offer to get any of them, Get in line, say yes, get your appointment, go out. In the meantime, remember that this isn't done. As Dr. Norman said, uh, mm-hmm. even if there's no, I'll say, requirement, right? If you're not told you must do something like wear a mask, that doesn't mean you can't. Um, and continue to do all those things that you know, uh, and we all know, have uh, helped us manage this throughout our community for over a year now. Uh, we'll be back with you tomorrow. Stay safe.